Generally, when you first think that you've written a story, you haven't. You've written a draft. Uh, it's that vital first stage uh, to get the idea that's in your head down on the page. The work of understanding who your characters are, their motivations, the setting in which what they do takes place. Uh, sometimes this can only be worked out in the act of putting down those early drafts. And often this takes a number of passes. It takes time. Writing takes time. Uh, Roald Dahl, in his collection Our Sweet Mystery of Life, writes in the preface, I did about four hours work a day, seven days a week. I was writing nothing but short stories at that time, and I wrote them slowly and carefully at my own pace. In this way, I would complete three or sometimes four of them each year. Now that gives you some idea of how long a, a master storyteller like Roald Dahl would spend on a short story. Now, hopefully in the process of these first phases that you've been through, you've developed a text that you are invested in and you are compelled by, that you feel is worth investing in. But essentially you have an awe, and, and an awe is a, is, a, is a rock that contains enough metal or, or metal compound to make it worthwhile extracting. So if you do feel that, then that's when the physical work starts. And by that, by physical work, I mean the too often neglected duty of improving the text uh, to make it tell the story in the strongest possible way. That means that you need to change how you approach the words you already have. Uh, by definition, if you want to vi mine the vital substance from something, you're going to be left with a lot of spoil. And the chances are there's material in your story that simply needs to be hacked away. So I'm going to give you some hacks uh, to help you approach the words that you already have on, on the page in a new way, to relegate them into units that are there to do a job. Um, that will allow you to go about the duty of scrutiny. Now, the brain is very, very good at saving energy, and it can make shortcuts. If you're very familiar with the text, uh, I think that what happens is you lose the ability to sharply interrogate it. Here's an example of how the brain can make these leaps. That sentence, look at it again, is garbage. But what's happened is your brain has unscrambled the letters in between the first and the last. As long as the first and the last are in the right place, your brain just sorts them out. So if you imagine if you've done all this work, you're extremely familiar with a piece of writing, then it's likely that your brain is going to be skipping some of the aspects which perhaps need to be more strongly addressed. Um, so one thing that is a very, very useful exercise is to change the format of the piece. Now I handwrite, so here's a piece of text that I scribbled down off the bat and I did that so that I had something to work from to give you some working examples as to what I mean when I say uh, you apply these hacks to a piece of writing. Changing the format is very important. It's, if you type this up, it goes from being something which is written in your own handwriting, something very personal. The act of typing is an act of investigation and editing and reception, if you like. It then changes from that, from that manuscript handwriting to a amorphous text, amorphous font. It sits on a white screen. It distances it from you in a way I think really allows you to look at it with a little more kind of with a colder eye, which is very, very important. So I've typed this up. That's three stages of thing. If, if you actually obviously work on screen, print it out. Try copying hand copying some paragraphs. The other thing is just jumping around individual paragraphs rather than starting at the top of the story all the time and then moving through it. You know, you're then going over the same ground in the same way each time. If you just pick random paragraphs and investigate those, what you'll be doing is you'll telescope your eye onto the words themselves rather than get sucked into the kind of more narrative questions. So I've typed this out and printed it out. 
And what I'd like to show you first is a trick in their word games, if you like. You've been using your brain for the sort of more philosophical, psychological, emotional elements of your story. This now really engages the part of the brain which is more used to puzzles. One puzzle, one game, is to find the INGs in the piece, any word ending with ING. And I can see this here. I was trying to think straight, but the grating noise of the chainsaw that had been going all morning was ripping through any chance I had of laying out my thoughts in any sort of order. The clock was ticking, and I was starting to feel the pressure of the deadline. I mean, you can hear it in ticks. If you do work on screen and you just do a word search for ING in early drafts, you'll often just be shocked that there's a kind of measles of highlighted ings that you that you'd really need to address ing the ing ending can be quite passive um, if you activate it so for example i was trying i tried to think straight but the grating noise of the chainsaw that it, maybe keep grating noise that that had been going all morning okay so how about shifting but the noise of the chainsaw that had been going all morning going can stay grated and ripped instead of grating and ripping we put those together there grated and ripped through any chance i had of laying through any chance i had to lay out my thoughts in any sort of order the clock was ticking the clock ticked and i was starting and i started to feel the pressure of the deadline so even in those first few sentences and you can pause the screen here if you want to go back and look at this or give yourself a little more time you'll see that there's a lot of work to do and it just makes it more it just makes it more present if you like it, it, it creates more pace through the piece so the changing the ing is one thing um, what you can then do is resort to maths if you like so again you're using a different part of your brain and you can take a text and you can decide to play the game of reducing it by a determined percentage 10 percent is obviously easy math so if we look at that sentence or if we look at um, i tried to think straight but the noise of the chainsaw that had been going all morning grated and ripped through any chance i had to lay out my thoughts in any sort of order that has 35 words in it so to lose 10 percent, i need to decide which three to four words need to go what i'm doing here is i'm as i said focusing very hard what can go it's brutally uh, pragmatic so I tried to think straight, but that so straight can go. I tried to think, but the noise of the chainsaw that had been going all morning grated and ripped through any chance I had to lay out my thoughts, in, to lay to lay my thoughts in any sort of order, in any order. So what I'm losing there is straight out and sort of because I've compressed the sentence. What I also notice when I then hear it, I tried to think, but the noise of the chainsaw that had been going all morning, grated and ripped through any chance I had to lay out my thoughts in any order. Suddenly, because there's fewer words, the wrong words stick out more, and any seems awkward, so I can cut one of those any's. There we are, so I get rid of that, I cut the second any. Now, when you're left with that, I think you've compressed the text, you've got rid of some of the extraneous stuff. The next approach is really to interrogate what you're left with if uh, these word-based exercises these games if you like have refocused you in a way so in going through the entire piece i thought well if this chainsaw has been going all morning is it not more dramatic for it to kick in at a point when he really has to focus and engage he's wasted the time and then there's this chainsaw so yeah that I kept rid of that. I tried to think, but the noise of the chainsaw that had been going all morning, I can get rid of that. And that leaves me with the first sentence. I tried to think, but the noise of the chainsaw grated and ripped through any chance I had to lay my thoughts in order. Okay. That done this interrogative process, this pushing, um, I say a slight refocus, a slight, a slight change in your relationship with the text, and it can really help to go in with questions about the order of information. Now, that for me is a very, very vital way of manipulating your reader. How do you tell them? When do you tell them? Too often, perhaps a writer will 
will lose a chance to just add a little curiosity, mystery, some question that the, that the reader might otherwise ask. At the moment, I tried to think, but the noise of the chainsaw grated and ripped through any chance I had to lay my thoughts in order. What if I take out that chainsaw from the f opening of that sentence? And I leave it as a mystery, right? There's this noise. What is the noise? Then I can reveal it. Actually, I can then bring in a detail about the morning, which makes it clear why this chainsaw suddenly kicking in is such a problem. Um, and I can be left with, I tried to think straight, but the noise grated, ripped through any chance I had to lay my thoughts in order. I had wasted the morning, and now there was the chainsaw. The clock ticked. So in three very, very short, compressed sentences, I've attempted to kind of bring the reader much more intimately into the state of mind of the character. I do this with the whole piece. Um, and you go through those INGs, you make percentage cuts, you therefore see where there maybe is a collision of language somewhere or where a particular thing that you've written down in the in that initial processes can be made to work harder or where the order of something can change. And I was left with, I tried to think straight, but the noise grated, ripped through any chance I had to lay my thoughts in order. I had wasted the morning, and now there was the chainsaw. The clock ticked. There was no way to avoid it. I had to get this done. All morning I had dawdled, only half concentrated, allowed myself to be distracted. For the better part of ten minutes I'd watched a weevil work its way up the white wall of my shed. I blamed the chainsaw, more and more angry. Time was up. I sat there, idiotically. Idiotically, originally, was I sat there like an idiot. Wherever you see, like something, see if you can tweak that in order to actually make the thing itself the character of what it's like. It's a clumsy way of saying it, but hopefully the example shows it better than I've explained it. I sat there like an idiot. I sat there idiotically. Again, you compress the writing. Other things happen during the review of that piece. You can often find places where you've written several words that one word could do instead. I wasn't going to be able to could become I couldn't. So I wasn't going to be able to get away with giving can become I couldn't. And you get six words turning to one. Again, that compresses the language. The reader doesn't have to consume those extra calories, if you like, and it makes for a much leaner text. So that piece that I just read out, originally that's, that scribble down thing was 230 words, 231 words, and it's down to 97 words. That's 134 words that were cut, which is a cut of nearly 60%. So I should leave by saying that concision isn't necessarily a game that aims at the, the lowest possible word count. It's, it aims at the most efficient, effective, appropriate way of telling a story. And the end game is to make that seem effortless. And if you don't put the effort in, then your reader will have to. And that will get in the way of the emotional transport, the, the story's ambition, the spell you're trying to cast.